Good morning, and thank you all for being here. Um, as advertised, I'm Amy Goldstein. I'm the National <laughs> Healthcare Policy Writer for The Post. And uh, you just heard a panel, obviously, about um, the political conversation, to put it politely, on Capitol Hill on healthcare. And we're going to take a more on-the-ground view about what's happening in the Affordable Care Act marketplaces. And I'm joined by a great panel here of people who really know what they're talking about. Uh, to my immediate uh, left is Marilyn Tavner. Marilyn's the president of America's Health Insurance Plans, which is a group whose members provide health and related benefits to 200 million people in this country. Uh, Marilyn came to this position in 2015, a few months after she had stepped down as the administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is the agency within the Department of Health and Human Services that oversees much of the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, before that, uh, Marilyn was Virginia's health secretary. And before that, she had worked her way up to CEO of a large for-profit company called the Hospital Corporation of America. So thank you. Peter Lee uh, is executive director of California's health benefit exchange called Covered California. Cover California was the first state-run insurance exchange in the country that was created under the Affordable Care Act. And the last figures I could find uh, last night said that you have 1.4 million people who are enrolled in insurance through Cover California. So that's a lot of people when you think about a little over 10 million people in this country with ACA coverage. Peter also has a past life within the Obama administration. Um, he was the deputy director of CMS's Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which has been trying to design new models of care and of paying for care uh, under the ACA. Uh, before that, uh, Peter was director of delivery system reform in HHS's Office of Health Reform. And then on the far end <laughs> is Jody Ray, who is director and principal investigator for the health exchange Florida Covering Kids and Families, which is based at the University of South Florida's College of Public Health. This exchange had the distinction of having gotten the largest federal navigator grant in the country. Not quite as large as it used to be, but you've had the largest. Um, and uh, Florida has been a real standout at enrolling people under the ACA. Before the ACA came along, Jody already had a long, long history of working to develop um, methods of helping people sign up for coverage for all kinds of public benefits, Medicaid, CHIP, and um, all around trying to cut down the number of people who are uninsured. So welcome to you all. So we're going to start um, with the fact that today, October 25th, is one week away from the start of the fifth enrollment period under the ACA. Now, how many of you in the audience remember year one when the federal help site, uh, website, healthcare.gov, had a few troubles that helped people <laughs> enrolling at the beginning? <laughs> And then do you remember year two when people were kind of holding their breath to see whether the website would work? <laughs> and it mostly did. And um, then year three and year four became more and more boring, um, which was a relief to people. Um, and I checked last night and verified my memory that last year was so routine that I didn't even write a story on the first day of open enrollment. Well, I don't think anyone would say that year five is routine. Uh, so I'd like to start by going down the row and asking each of you to briefly say the top two ways that from your own vantage points, this year is really different than last year and perhaps than you have been expecting it to be. And we're going to do sort of a mini countdown. So if you could start by each giving the second biggest way that things are different than you thought they would be, and then we'll go through and get your, your top uh, nominee. Right. So Marilyn. All right, I'll start with basically some of the technical changes, not as it relates to healthcare.gov, but as it relates to the open enrollment timeframe. Uh, and this is something that the Trump administration had put out in rules earlier this year and something that AHIP had supported, which was to align the enrollment period closer to what has been typical for Medicare or typical to an employee or employer market. So it's now November 1 to December 15th. So you're starting with a much shorter time frame, and you're also not moving into the next calendar year, which created problems with folks who were uh, trying to get new cards or switch uh, carriers at the beginning of a calendar year. So because it's in a short time frame, then obviously we've had some other things happen. 
it's very important that people understand there's only a 45 day period this year, much shorter. Okay, so the compressed time frame. Yes. Peter. Yeah, I'd say that the number two thing is not what's uh, different, what's the same in California, which is we have a, a full three month open enrollment period. We've got the same 11 plans as last year. We have competitive prices and for California, it feels like an alternate universe. So that's what's different is that last year we were in many states that were sort of moving ahead with things coming in balance. This year, one of a few states that's still in balance in the, in the concept of what's happening nationally. All right, Jody. I would say probably one of the unexpected changes um, was the um, reduction in, in, in the funding for navigators, which means fewer people on the ground to provide those enrollment assistance services. Um, I think that was unexpected, definitely a change for this year. Okay. Yeah. I'm surprised that's not your number one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about your number one too now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's your number one pick? So for me, it's probably just the ongoing confusion and instability uh, that led to insurers pricing <laughs> two, three, four times this year, depending on who was on the news late, the latest, right? So we have actually states that had four sets of pricing, and then at the end still had states that will now have to go back or are going back inside certain states and repricing based on the cessation of the subsidies or the cost sharing reductions. So I'd say just confusion and repricing has been the number one issue about then how do you try to market it when you haven't settled on what you're doing, so. Okay, Peter. Um, I think for us in California, it's the very loud distant thunder uh, from Washington, which is incredible uncertainty, and then having to manage for that uncertainty. And in California, we've done a lot of things to manage it to give our plan certainty so that they'll participate, which they are again, and give consumers certainty uh, that they'll have the same choices, the same options, and good prices. But that's, that's in, we're, we're swimming upstream in a way that we haven't had to swim upstream in a long time. Okay, and Jody. Um, I think goes, going back to what you said to begin with was, you know, how the last two open enrollment periods sort of got almost routine and, um, and, you know, in some ways that was almost a good thing. I mean, I can speak for Florida, we saw an increase in enrollment each year of open enrollment. So we didn't see consumers get lax. What they got was more informed and more confident. So they were more engaged and they, they were able to come in with a lot more information. I think we, we really achieved something. Now we're going back to the first year and I think one of the biggest changes we're experiencing this year, particularly after the last three years, was that our consumers are not more informed. They're more confused than ever. They are more uncertain. Um, and some of them are actually letting premiums lapse because they thought the law was repealed. They are really not um, as, as informed as they, we'd hoped they'd be by year five because of this. Okay, that's very helpful. So that gives all of you a sense of the landscape for this year uh, starting on November 1st. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about each of the issues that you raised. So let me ask you a couple of things, Marilyn. Okay. Um, I want to read you a quote from a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation analysis of the marketplace for the coming year that came out yesterday. Okay. It said, local players, blues, regional carriers, and provider-sponsored plans now dominate the individual market. The national commercial segment has almost completely exited the individual market and now has the smallest participation at the county level. Now, I know that as head of AHIP, you don't speak for any individual insurance carrier, right. but as an industry, is that characterization accurate? And to the extent that it's even partly accurate, what accounts for that? Well, I, I think it, the statement's accurate uh, in terms of if you follow some of the national for-profit carriers, such as United, Aetna, and uh, Humana, they have certainly, over the last two or three years, steadily decreased and exited the market. Uh, Anthem is an exception. Anthem did uh, shrink their footprint, but they are still very involved in many states, including California and Virginia and others. But what is also not accounted for in that are companies like Centene and Molina, 
who basically serve Medicaid population and the individual market. So they are examples of large national carriers that are still very engaged and may be the only carrier in lots of rural areas. And they've so been sort of niche markets, as you say. Up they do, now. Yeah. they do. And they do not participate so much in the employer-sponsored market or in Medicare products. So partially true, it's accurate. Certainly large, large investor owns have exited the market because they weren't able to. It's a very small piece of the market, you know, three to 5% of most employers, I mean, of most uh, insurance plans. And so they couldn't have it break even or make a small margin. So they decided to exit and concentrate on other lines of business. But so, Amy, I just need to chime in is that they exited after entering the market new after the Affordable Care Act. Right. Most of those large national plans were not in the individual market five years ago. Right. So we talk about this being a big change. They stuck it's their really toes in, got their toes smashed, and have stepped back out. But right. they weren't exiting something they'd been in for 20 years. All of those plans, small individual market prior to the ACA. That's right, but part of the goal of the ACA, wasn't it, was to encourage these large right. players and to become part of uh, the coverage options for people buying well, insurance on their own. And the other thing that folks don't talk about are new entrants into the market. F companies like Oscar, Medica. Um, Medica is a very small company that's focused totally in the individual market, covering several Midwestern states that would be without coverage today and taking a huge risk in doing so in a very uncertain environment. Also, certainly there, there's been a lot more integrated delivery systems entering health insurance plans and entering the market. We have about 170 members total. About 40 of those are integrated delivery systems who may have started as a health plan or started as a hospital and then have integrated products. Kaiser is one of the largest, and that's another uh, company that's in the market on both the East Coast and the West Coast. Okay, so let me ask you something different. Um, so the matter of cost-sharing reduction subsidies came up in your... Uh, top two uh, change uh, <laughs> lists. And all year long, the common wisdom has been that if the ACA's so-called CSR payments, which are payments to insurers to reimburse them for discounts that the law requires insurers uh, provide to people with a little bit lower incomes in the individual market. So the common wisdom has been that if those CSRs were eliminated, that would be the worst thing that could happen and the markets would collapse. And I was interested that, you know, not only have you been talking about the need for stability to anybody who will listen this year in the government or out, but I noticed that your main spokeswoman uh, a few months ago um, was asked about uh, the importance of cost sharing reduction payments continuing. And she said that they were priority one, two, and three for us. Well, now the president has gone ahead and done it. He's eliminated the, the, uh, the payments. So now that they're gone, was all that talk hyperbole or the market's about to collapse? <laughs> I don't think the markets are about to collapse. In fact, I would say the markets are pretty stubborn, okay? Mm -hmm. what, I think the reason that Christine said this was priority one, two, and three is if they go away and they have, then you have to price over them. So that's about a 20% increase in premiums. So immediately the low income individuals who had cost sharing subsidies are still protected because they're co-pays and deductibles we still will cover those. So what happens is you increase the premium to handle that first dollar coverage or close to first dollar coverage. That is okay, that's a way to do it, cost the government more. But the second part of it is many, many people are in the individual market who do not get subsidies. So they get the full freight of any kind of price increase. And that's the part, that's why it's one, two, and three. Many of the people who voted for President Trump in this election are gonna be the people who are affected with premiums going up three, 400. I've heard $400 a month from two people who happen to be my two siblings in Virginia and North Carolina who are in the individual market. And the third one I heard was from, I'll just say a member of Congress last night whose premium went up $800 a month for a family. I mean, that's the kind of hit that people are gonna take if they're not in a subsidy. But you and others have been saying not just that the prices would skyrocket, which they're now doing, right. um, or we're doing in preparation for this maybe happening, um, but that insurers would just flee. Well, we certainly have seen some insurers exit, and that was the last question, but I think what we've seen more than that is insurers are in the business of providing coverage. So they're not gonna exit a market unless they absolutely have to. So many of them have chose to price over the subsidy stay in the market with the hope, Alexander Murray is an example, of some bipartisan effort to try to stabilize these markets. The individual market's not going away. It has a tough history. We actually stabilized it for a few years. 
it's entering another tough period. We really need some bipartisan effort to solve the problem. Well, let me ask you just one more thing about that, and this is more a political question, so it's kind of a little reversion to the first panel. <laughs> but you have been saying all year to folks on Capitol Hill that this is really important to guarantee these payments. Um, you know, there's talk about it. There's no certainty that this bill is going to pass. If it passes the Senate, no certainty what's going to happen in the House or whether the, the president would sign it. So what can you do at this late date, so close to open enrollment, to ramp up that message, to increase the odds that this is actually going to happen. I mean, it's not new news that you think that right. these payments are essential. Well, obviously, we were working closely with Senator Alexander and Senator Murray to try to make sure that there's an understanding that the stability needs to be known. There's talk about funding the subsidies in 18 and 19. The problem that you have, if we don't have certainty around the subsidies, is you watch these premiums go up, more and more people, healthy people, who can't afford this drop out of the market, so then you have a higher number of uninsured. I think we saw some of those statistics this week. And then the second thing you have is then it becomes kind of a closed market. The market keeps shrinking, and then you get into trouble in 19 and 20 and beyond, and that's what we're trying to prevent. Okay. Thank you. So, Peter, as Marilyn was just saying, um, the question of how much insurers should be allowed to charge for the coming year um, in those states, including California, that have a role in setting rates, um, has been a big complicated question. So I'm wondering if you could talk about both what California has been doing since you began to think about this pretty early and what you're seeing now in states that weren't as far out as you were in beginning to, uh, to think through how to handle this uncertainty. Yeah, I guess one, I want to just strongly agree with Marilyn that the issue of certainty and stability isn't just in 2018 issue, it's, it's 19 and 20. Health plans think multi-year. And so the issue of cost sharing reduction subsidies is for 18, but it's also health plans are deciding now thinking about 19 and beyond. So, you know, we adopted a program being ready for what ended up happening, the non-funding. And our solution was to load all the costs to cover this on the silver tier only. I know this is wonky, but also to have off exchange, no surcharge to cover this cost. So Can in you just California, explain for people who might not know, what is the silver tier and why is that so, so important? So the, within uh, the ACA, there's four metal tiers, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Silver is the tier at which you get the cost sharing reduction subsidy. If you pick any other tier, you don't get that special subsidy. It means your out of pocket is, in California, $5 when you go to the doctor instead of $35. That's uh, the practical turn of what the cost sharing reduction does. So we have about 70% of our enrollment in silver. People that pick bronze, often get a free high deductible plan. They, they don't pay anything because the subsidy is so large, um, but they don't get the cost sharing reduction subsidy to them. Same with gold. So silver is very, very important. But so our workaround, and, and we, were, we worked on this seven months ago because seven months ago, our plans came to us and said, you know, some of them, we won't play in 18 if you can't give us certainty given the uncertainty coming out of Washington. Said, Fine, we'll give you certainty. It's not a great solution, but it's the best solution. So by pricing this surcharge at silver, it means two things. One, people that don't get subsidies. And I want to think, we talk about marketplaces and markets. California has 1.4 million people in Cover California, 1.1 buying in the individual market outside of Cover California. It's two and a half million people, all paying the same price for the overall premium, but people in Covered California get financial help. But we should be talking about nationally, we talk about it, we aren't protecting exchanges. We're protecting 18 million Americans that rely on the individual market, half of whom get no subsidy. And they're the ones getting hurt most in many parts of the, of the country. California, no subsidy, no surcharge to cover this. On exchange, there's a surcharge, but we run the numbers. The 80% of our people get a subsidy. They're, what they're writing as a check to get their coverage actually will go down on average 1% in 2018 compared to 2017, on average. Now, if we hadn't had to do this awful workaround for the CSR surcharge, their expense would have stayed flat. Instead, it went down 1%. So this is, you know, it's going to be confusing. We've got people scared of sticker shock, but we're able to sort of lean in and give them the tools and information so they'll know that they'll be held harmless. You know, one thing I've wondered is you and I have talked about what California's been doing over some time. So as you just said, um, and I'm going to repeat it again because I think it's important, that for people who don't qualify for subsidies, whose incomes are too high, um, they can buy an equivalent health plan outside the exchange. 
And, and not only that, I mean, I want to mm. that we directed our health plan, but we're sort of a pushy purchaser, to, <laughs> to offer identical products right. off exchange, except no surcharge. So when people are shopping, they know the benefits are ones that there isn't a big deductible between them and their care. I mean, they're, they're good benefit designs that aren't this hocus pocus co-insurance gobbledygook. So. Okay, so speaking of nerdy, here's my question. <laughs> so if you have more people that 20% who don't qualify for subsidies gravitating to plans outside the exchange, is that going to hurt your risk pool, which is No, the it benefits the risk pool. I mean, that's one of the things that we lose the sight of is that the risk pool is all 2.5 million. Every time we have a healthy person leave coverage. And remember, people that get subsidies are shielded from these increases. The people I worry about are healthy 50-year-olds that don't get a subsidy. If they leave the risk pool, premiums are going to go up. And that hurts the risk pool. So, you know, I don't care where someone enrolls. If they don't get a subsidy, buy through Cover California, buy direct from Kaiser or Anthem or whatever, but don't leave the market. And so I think that we often talk about protecting exchanges. We aren't protecting exchanges. We're protecting a common risk pool and an individual market that has you know, over 18 million Americans insured. Okay. So let me ask you something else that you mentioned a moment ago. Um, as you said, your um, uh, open enrollment period is going to run from a week from today through January 31st, which yes, it is. is the same length that <coughs> was nationally yeah. all over the country. You're one of a few states that's doing that. Not really. Well, not that many. Not that many. Because so three dozen states are relying on uh, Absolutely. Federal the federal marketplace. Market. Yep. So in all those states, the <coughs> moment here is going to end November 15th, yeah. uh, December 15th. And I know that this is not your situation, but I'm just curious, looking at the rest of the country from out there on the West Coast, what difference do you think it's going to make elsewhere to have this really shortened enrollment period? Well, uh, OMG. I mean, I, I, would, uh, I would be terrified right now. And, and I want to be really clear that, that the change of the open enrollment period was not a Trump plan. It came out of the Obama administration because health plan said, we want to get everyone signed up before we start the calendar year. So I want to be really clear, this isn't part of some big Machiavellian something. But we decided, because states have the flexibility to set their own open enrollment period, and we said, there's too much turbulence, too much uncertainty. We're gonna, we want all three months. And, I, and I'm so glad we did that. Because <coughs> there's a trade-off of people losing a few months of coverage. But in this year, we need time to talk to people. We need time to have people that renew. With Covered California, if people are renewing, we auto-renew them in the plan they were in, but they can change all the way to the end of open enrollment, which means till the end of January. That open enrollment period being long is so important. We will, though, be pounding the drum like you know, Jody will be in, in Florida saying, sign up by December 15th so you get a full year of coverage. But then we've got plenty of time to do cleanup. And, and we'll be spending, you know, and I, this is maybe a separate <coughs> question, but in California, we're spending $111 million on marketing and outreach, supporting our navigator programs, supporting paid advertising. And Give you some context, the cutback in federal spending from uh, paid advertising was from 100 million to 10 million. The federal government to support 36 states is spending about what we spend in California on digital advertising alone. And that's a recipe for bad risk. It's a, bad, it's a recipe for healthy people not signing up. So instead of doubling down and spending more money because it's shorter time, and I, I'm really worried about this, it's bad math, the federal government is stepping away from marketing when it's needed most. So, Jody, you're looking a little envious at the resources that we will be able to spend. <laughs> Sorry, Jody. <laughs> um, you know, it strikes me that in the spring, uh, the Trump administration, people who worked in uh, Centers for Medicaid and Medicaid Services, SOSIO, which is the branch that most closely works with the marketplaces, told navigators, don't worry, you've got a three-year commitment from us, your funding is going to be roughly what it was in the past. And then along comes early September, and the administration announced that the funding was going to be cut for navigator grants by, on average, 41%. And the administration justified this by saying that many of the navigators had not been efficient, had not been enrolling many people. And I'm just curious, I can see your, uh, <laughs> your blood pressure is rising when I even broach what they've said. but. Um, is there any validity to the argument that not all navigators have done a good job, or is that just a pretext? 
I would say it's important to recognize uh, what the role of navigators really is. Um, I think it's important to know that now the, the job of the navigators is not, it's not even just enrollment. You know, uh, filling out the application and hitting, hitting the enroll button isn't the most difficult thing that in navigators are doing. Um, and I think when you so narrowly define their success simply by that, it's unfortunate because navigators are, they're helping consumers resolve some of their complex cases. You know, people that come to navigators for help are those that need help. So that they tend to be some of the most vulnerable populations. They tend to be, you know, populations that are hardest to reach. Um, and so, you, you know, there are language barriers and literacy language uh, barriers. So I think um, recognizing that you have to have navigators that are going out into rural areas where transportation is an issue. They're helping um, file exemptions if they don't um, qualify for APTCs. Uh, they are helping people understand health insurance. So a consumer doesn't always come in ready to, if, you know, here's all my personal information, hit enroll and select a plan. You're going through provider networks, you're going through uh, formularies to see if the medications are covered under the different plans. You're spending time explaining the difference between coinsurance and um, co-payments and what the deductible is and how that will apply to your out-of-pocket costs. Um, you know, they're filing appeals, they're doing SCPs, they're doing uh, a lot of public education. Appeals so, meaning special enrollment period applications. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, so special enrollment. So this is a year-long activity. First of all, it's not doesn't just incur during open enrollment. And I think the other thing that's important to recognize is a whole lot of people apply because you have people going out into the communities doing that public education piece. So we reach a lot of folks by doing that, that maybe are confident in going home and filling out an application now that they know more about the program. So I think, um, first of all, it was unfortunate to so narrowly define the, the success of the navigators. And, and let me just explain that, meaning that what the administration based to each group's grant was on how many people had enrolled just in the marketplace plans, not helped enroll in Medicaid or did the kind of education uh, that you're talking about? Sure, you're connecting families to the CHIP program. You're also, you know, we get people in that don't, do not qualify for the CSRs or the tax credits. So then what do you do? You want to help that person connect to health services in some way in the community. So the navigators do spend a lot of time trying to find out what resources can they help a consumer um, take advantage of it, regardless of the fact that they're uninsured and they're going to remain uninsured. Okay. Yeah, actually, actually, just really, really, I mean, I'm going to be crass, is that some navigators do better jobs than others. That's true. And I think that, Jody, look at the enrollment in Florida, huge enrollment compared to Texas. I don't know the navigators in Texas, but, but Jody's done a great job, in, but there are differences. But the other thing we talk about navigators, about 5% of our enrollment is through navigators that we front. 50% is through insurance agents. And let's, when we talk about what's happening, I worry about health plans stopping paying commissions to insurance agents. 50% of our enrollment. Which has been happening. Insurance agents. Absolutely, it's happening. Yeah. We've got some plans, and like in Connecticut, I think, the two plans there are stopping paying commissions to insurance agents. That's a really bad formula. So we've got some uh, questionable policies being happened federally, but also some of the health plans are making some dumb moves too. And luckily, states like Florida have really good health plans, like the Blue Cross of Florida, they aren't losing money. They're enrolling people, they're working closely with Jody and Navigators, but they're also working with the agent community. It's just, remember the whole spectrum of what it takes to get people enrolled. Do you want to say anything about the plans that said <laughs> decisions? Well, I think the decisions that are made around, you know, contractors or brokers is very dependent on, on how a plan is doing. If it becomes what they have to do to stay in business, then they'll change. And then some of them, I don't know that anyone, despite what you hear about insurance bailouts and otherwise, if you look, and there's been a couple of studies out recently about how the individual market is doing, first of all, they have an MLR requirement. Second, they oh, also, explain what that is. yes, they, there are <laughs> minimum ratios that you have to provide to direct care. And then there's a piece for administrative overhead. Many of these plans are break even at best. Some of them make a small margin and many of them lo lost money and have exited the business. And so this insurance bailout for this segment of the industry is kind of like a dream. It's not reality. 
But there are folks who, I, I agree with Peter, I, we, you don't ever want to see agents and brokers cut out of the situation because they're very helpful, but sometimes that's, that's done to keep a plan in business. Okay. So back to your sad shrinking navigator grants. Um, <laughs> you had uh, $5.8 million roughly from the federal government uh, to do your group's work last year and is down to 4.9 uh, million. So that's not nearly the biggest cut that navigator groups are getting, but it's significant. So I'm wondering if you can talk about how you're having to adjust things to cope and what you're seeing around the country among your counterparts that have even substantially bigger reductions in federal money. Sure. Um, I, certainly the percentage was uh, smaller than some that I've seen. Um, our grant actually covers the entire state of Florida. So we have navigators from Pensacola to Key West. So it's a big state. It's dem demographically and geographically very diverse. So um, a $900,000 cut to our navigator grant um, you know, that's a lot of assisters. It's also a lot of the communication and marketing efforts. I think we all anticipated cuts to the communication and marketing efforts um, from the federal level, um, maybe not to the extent that they occurred, uh, but we did not um, expect them at, um, the, at the grantee level. And so where we had originally thought, okay, here's the plan we're gonna implement because we know we're gonna be responsible for getting the word out about, particularly the shortened open enrollment period. Um, we've had to accommodate those cuts. That's a lot of people in communities on the ground that w won't be available. Um, and we also cut back on those marketing and communication efforts because the resources are not there that we thought would be there. Um, that being said, uh, we've accommodated the cuts because we had to do what we needed to do, and we're going to work How really hard. How did you do hard. that? Huh? How did you do that? You, you take them out of... I, my job was to not decimate any one area because they're all important things. You know, you, you, consumers digest information different ways, multiple, you know, sources. So it doesn't... There's no value in saying, well, we're going to just do without that. Um, so, you know, it was sort of like a skim across the top and you took it out of the projects and where they have the navigators and the communities and out of the communications and, and marketing. So um, everything took a hit um, to accommodate the cuts. But um, navigators, we also mod uh, ramped up the staffing during open enrollment in a way that that more so than has any other year, you know, in part because of the shortened open enrollment period. And, um, you know, we know there's going to be challenges. We are expecting these challenges. And um, they're going to work long hours. They're compassionate, passionate folks. This is who does this work. Um, and I feel like, um, you know, they're going to work really hard, long days, and we're gearing up. Um, and we're all going to do the very best we can. And we're, we're, getting, we're reaching out to consumers we have served over the last four years in each one of our regions. Every single consumer that we have reached, we are calling them and letting them know, A, about the shortened open enrollment period. First thing we need to tell people. And let them know that it's really important that they actually review their plans um, and because, you know, if they wait till the auto re renewal, um, they may, you know, they're going to find themselves maybe in a situation where they're in a plan that doesn't actually work for them. So I, it's important to come in and sit down and review the plan options. And so that's what we're doing. I mean, we're doing, we're doing whatever we can, but we're aggressively reaching out to consumers um, and we're trying to identify spokespersons that can resonate with young adults and, you know, different populations. And, you know, we're doing Spanish PSAs and radio and TV, whatever we can. Um, we're going to do, we're, we're going to be diverse in our, in our communication and, um, and our one-on-one -on -one reach. And so all those being said, that's the plan. <laughs> we're gearing up and uh, it's going to happen. Okay, so we have just about a minute left, and I'm going to put you on the spot for a final question. Um, we're in a climate in which there is widespread evidence, as some of you have mentioned, of much higher consumer confusion than there's been in previous years, except for maybe the first year. Um, the reality is that there is a president in the White House who has on a number of occasions said that the ACA marketplaces are either dead or nearly dead. Um, 
Given all that, the rates are going up, um, in part because of the lack of CSR payments, so compensating for that. So given all that climate, when we're at the end of this open enrollment period, if we had 12.2 million people having signed up for coverage at the end of the last open enrollment period, what's the number going to be at the end of this year? What's your prediction? Just <laughs> quickly go down the road. <laughs> so it was 12.4 or 12. So I mm -hmm. say probably, um, I'll go with a little over 11 million. I think it will have some effect. Okay. Um, two, no well, I'll give you three numbers. Sorry, first is <laughs> nationally, I think close to 10 million. I think we could easily lose 2 million Americans coverage because of the lack of marketing nationally. Uh, the bigger number though is what is it of the 18 million? Because I want to keep on coming. We shouldn't be talking just about those that are in marketplaces. It's the entire individual market. And I'm worried we're going to see steep declines of unsubsidized that aren't counted in those numbers. So that what worries me a lot. In California, I think we'll be about 1.4. Uh, in covered California. I think that we're going to be spending our $111 million. I think we'll be pretty flat this year, but I think the rest of the nation is going to be in uh, deep doo-doo. Mm. <laughs> well, we in Florida have an amazing team of navigators under the Con Covering Florida group, which is my group of navigators across the state. And we know that Florida has enrolled, last year was about 1.7 million. We have to do that in half the time. Um, however, I would say we saw our peak, you know, heading into that December 15th day. Um, and I think the trend has shown that that's where, you know, we're seeing, we've seen some of the highest numbers. Um, I don't have a number, but I am optimistic that we are going to invest uh, every bit of waking hours to reach every individual that we were capable of reaching um, during the previous open enrollment periods. So um, I'm persistent and optimistic. Okay, so we have grit in the face of adversity here. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's all the time we have for today. Um, I'd like to thank each of you on the panel for joining us and a reminder to our audience that you can watch highlights from today's program and find upcoming Washington Post programs at WashingtonPostLive.com. Thank you all very much. <laughs>